I'm Drew Stevenson, and this is a video for my Law and Economics seminar. And in this one, I'm introducing the economics of property law or insights from economics that we can apply to property law. And for my students, I want you to recall some of the different concepts or, or doctrines that you studied in your first year uh, property class, like adverse possession um, and the uh, 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 the different types of estates and land that people could own, inheritance uh, rights and land, the doctrine of trespass, uh, and so forth, and also um, some of the concepts that you might encounter in a land use uh, course in law school. And what we do is we we look at all of those things through a a property or an I'm sorry, an economics uh, lens. So let's take a look at my slides. This is the introductory uh, lecture to this unit. So first, I have to uh, confess to my students, a lot of the law and economics textbooks and treatises uh, designed for the law school or college classes focus their property chapter on bargaining um, and negotiations and exchanges and on the Coase theorem. And I cover the Coase theorem in other units and bargaining when I do uh, contracts. Even so, we're going to talk about them some here, but you should be aware that uh, if we were using one of the standard case books um, or Richard Posner's uh, treatise, uh, the Cooter and Ulin's book, um, that they focus a lot on um, bargaining. And I, for me, I think of bargaining as something uh, more closely related to contracts. And so, but I do want my students to be aware when they're uh, doing their reading or re doing research and reading stuff for, uh, for their papers for my course, that a lot of professors and scholars associate the Coase theorem with property law and not just torts or contract. And so I'm going to give you the kind of classic or basic example of bargaining in the property context. And we're going to use a car instead of land to start with. So let's say you own one of these cool, like old cars, a, a classic car um, convertible that you take out uh, and drive sometimes in the summertime. You love this car. You cherish this car and you would not part with it for less than $10,000. Now I know cars like this could be worth a lot more than that, but I'm just humor me, we're going to use some round numbers. So let's say the car is worth $10,000 to you. That doesn't mean that you paid $10,000. You might have paid more a long time ago. You might have gotten it for free because you inherited this car or it was a gift. But the point is, um, you wouldn't consider parting the, the, the with the car um, for less than $10,000. Or if somehow your car were destroyed, you would um, be willing to save up and buy a replacement for $10,000, let's say. And now let's say that there's a billionaire car collector who um, is trying to uh, collect a lot of different types of classic cars. And they happen to be looking for the exact make and model and year uh, of the car that you own. And they're willing to pay up to $20,000 for it. And again, we're using round numbers and I know cars uh, could be worth a lot more than that. But um, it, the point is that in theory, assuming the two of you can find each other and um, you and the collector will uh, consummate the sale for somewhere between your um, uh, minimum and their maximum, which is $10,000 and $20,000 in theory. Now, how do we know where in that range it will fall? The, the, the first point was uh, you should be aware in these like little bargaining hypotheticals that it, it's pretty easy to start by estimating the range within which we, the transaction will uh, resolve, will, will take place um, somewhere. If And usually the seller has a minimum amount and the buyer has a maximum amount in mind that they're willing to pay. And as long as the max, the, the seller's uh, amount is, um, uh, lower than the buyer's amount, we're, we are in good shape to have a potential transaction occur. So what determines where in that range it will fall? Well, this could depend on a lot of things like negotiating skills and also comfort level with negotiating. So some people love um, haggling over prices. It's like a sport for them. They feel like they're playing uh, volleyball or badminton or tennis um, with this back and forth. How about this much? No, how about this much? Um, and other people are it, it just extremely uncomfortable with haggling over the prices. They, And in other words, they would be willing to sell the item for less than they might be able to get if they kept haggling because they hate haggling. Um, and so, and then there's people who love haggling. And so 
another reason is somebody could just be in a hurry, right? So let's say um, you love your car, but you just realize that you need uh, some money pretty quickly to pay for tuition next semester or to pay your rent. And so you're in a pretty big hurry to sell, or it could be a buyer is in a pretty big hurry to buy while they have the the money available or the financing lined up or there's an upcoming car show and they really want to have all their cars there um, or something like that. Um, also keep in mind that you could have not just people who kind of enjoy the haggling, but you could have one party be fiercely competitive by nature, right? So there are some people that just, um, it, it, the money's not the object. They just need to feel like they won or they got the better of somebody. And so psychologically, they derive the, a huge amount of enjoyment from feeling like they squeezed a little bit of a um, more money out of you. And um, and maybe you're the opposite. Maybe you're a generous person who's happy to give somebody else a good deal. Or maybe you're apathetic and feel like life is too short and you have better things uh, to worry about than ha <clears throat> haggling over that last dollar. All of these things could affect where we're going to fall between ten and twenty thousand dollars. Now let's talk about land and um, something an uh, economic concept called efficient allocation. One implication of Coase's work, Ronald Coase's work, and the Coase theorem is that property ownership. Um, will tend towards the most valuable usage or productive usage of the property, um, assuming a frictionless free market and where people can find each other and easily uh, negotiate and, and strike a deal. And so um, I, I'll give you a hypothetical that might remind you of first year law school. Let's say that Green Acre owns this land pictured here. He owns the land and farms the land and gets $1,000 a year in profits um, from whatever he grows on this particular parcel. But let's say there's somebody else, an industrial farmer um, named Goldacre, who could farm that same land, that same parcel, for 10 times as much, 100,000 a year. How, you say, could he make so much more than um, Greenacre? Well, maybe Greenacre is using uh, um, primitive tool farming tools, and Goldacre has the, the, the latest technology and the, the latest farming equipment, um, has uh, a, a huge staff of uh, workers. Um, maybe he's going to plant a much more lucrative crop. Um, or, or something like that, and or knows the, as the latest techniques from agri-science. All of these things could occur. Um, so uh, assuming that the current owner is really can only make a eke a thousand dollars a year out of the land, and Goldacre could get a hundred thousand a year out of the land. Um, eventually, assuming they can find each other and can negotiate a bargain. Um, Goldacre will want to buy out the land from Greenacre and Green, and they will find some price at which Greenacre would be willing uh, to sell. Of course, real life is more complicated than that. It might be that Greenacre is really stubborn and sentimentally attached to the land. It's been in his family for generations and, um, and things like that. And he feels snubbed by somebody who thinks that they could make the land more productive than he could. Um, it, it could be, though, that eventually we will go through some inter intermediaries. So let's say if Greenacre is really not producing very much from the property, he may eventually fall into um, problems with creditors who will uh, take ownership of the property and then sell it at auction. Or Greenacre may die and leave it to his heirs, and the heirs then have to make a decision, do we want to farm the land or do we want to sell it to Goldacre, who's going to pay us more than we could make uh, from the land. The point being, if you are reading Coase carefully and drawing inferences, um, that eventually, if it doesn't matter how many transactions it takes, but the person who's going to um, get the most value out of it will have a reason to buy out the other party who would get less value from that property. Um, and the party that gets less value will eventually have a reason to sell to the one. And so in the long run, resources end up allocating in a free market to those who would use them most efficiently or productively or put them to the most valuable use. Now, let's uh, go back in time for just a moment and talk about where we start with economics. The sort of uh, grandfather or patriarch of economics is Adam Smith, who wrote The Wealth of Nations, which was first published in 1776. 
And um, this is sort of the foundational text of capitalism. And so you may have heard of Adam Smith. If you haven't actually read the book, one section of the book, he lays out that there are basically two building blocks of all economics in every society, which he says are land and labor. All other values of goods or services derive ultimately from the fact that you have a limited number of people and they all only have 24 hours in a day. Um, and there's a finite amount of land in every country. And so if land and labor are both finite, um, and they're both necessary for producing or doing anything else, or at least one or the other or both are necessary, then ultimately you could take all prices and all values and work backwards and say, well, ultimately there was this much land needed and this much labor needed to produce this good. And this could be things like growing things or it could be manufacturing, right? So you need a certain amount of real estate for manufacturing. You need a factory or a workshop or a facility um, even if you're saying, oh, well, I'm just buying my raw materials and parts from someone else and putting them together in my garage, I don't. Really, it's not that much um, real estate. Well, at some point, whoever you're buying your raw materials and parts from, um, pulled them out of the ground or uh, cut them down off of the top of the uh, from the ground, and uh, somebody had to spend some time doing that, and that's the labor. And so. Ultimately, if we unpack or reverse engineer every price, we um, get back to land and labor. And that concludes my first lecture about property law and economics. And I'm going to follow up with two more, at least two more videos um, for this unit.